Uh, yeah, welcome to my Mega Games TED Talk. Uh, I'm going to attempt to screen share with you all now, so you should all see a thing popping up with my presentation on it. So we're all hoping that works. Uh, yeah, if you can just say in chat that that's working. Uh, can everyone see it? Okay, that's good. So. Thanks to Rebecca for that introduction. So, today I want to give some advice to people, anyone who's out there, and wants to run mega games, uh, but they aren't lucky enough to be near a big, awesome network of designers who can help them out. That's why I've called my game Mega Gaming in a Deserted Wasteland. So, uh, I won't be able to see any chat while I'm running this, because obviously I can't see it, because you can see what I can see. <laughs> so, uh, why did I start Mega Games Dundee? And where is Dundee? That's really the question here, isn't it? Well, I've included a handy diagram of where Dundee is. So, Dundee is here, uh, right on the borderlines of civilization, or at least civilization within the UK. If you're north of here, I don't count it as civilized. Apologies to anybody attending from Aberdeen. This is the desert that I live in. Uh, now, you may point out that Scotland is anything but a desert, but it's a metaphorical desert, particularly when we come to mega games. Now, before 2016, if I wanted to attend a mega game, I would have to go here. Uh, these were the UK mega games that I was was trying to attend at the time. There may have been others that I wasn't aware of, but these were the ones I was trying to attend, which meant that if I had to travel, it was a very long, unpleasant, usually expensive journey. Uh, for Watch the Skies 3 and 4, I attended by overnight bus, which is a 12-hour bus that arrives at 8 a.m. in London. I'd bleary-eyed make my, make my way across London in search of a croissant play a mega game, then I would be back on the bus, and I would arrive back in Scotland at 6am, uh, sometimes to go back to work. So that was fun. Uh, now Leeds obviously looks a lot closer if you're looking at this map of the UK, um, but that's deceptive because the train network is in fact lying to you. Um, the Leeds is almost as far as London despite distance. And ironically, Cambridge, despite being closer than London, takes four hours more to get to. These are some things I've learned in my mega gaming in the UK. So yeah, uh, me and Mega Games Dundee. So on the left here, we've got two pictures of me playing Mega Games. I'm sorry, I don't really take a lot of photos. That's what I discovered when making this presentation. Uh, the two photos are both me at Mega Games I attended. And there's about two years between them, um, which was pretty normal for me attending games back then. There was a considerable dis the, like, time between any games because there were so few games I could get to. Uh, on the right, we have me playing two games that were within three months of each other. And that's sort of the uh, the difference between uh, before I started running my own games and after, now that other people are running games. And basically, part of what I'm talking about here of when you're starting out and making a running a mega game uh, solo is basically that this is the inevitable outcome. So I'll be talking about that later. Right, so we'll talk about a brief history of my own mega gaming. Um, it's not as extensive as... Uh, as uh, some people's, but uh, I, I was doing it uh, basically alone for a good part portion of it, so we felt that the, uh, whenever Seamus approached me, he thought that that was something I should talk about. So, duh, 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 duh. so Beck obviously gave you an idea of who I am. I studied games design at Aberté uh, with a focus on analog games, because I am actually quite nerdy as a person. In my opinion, mega games are one of the most exciting forms of analog gaming available, so, and I've thoroughly enjoyed, enjoyed throwing myself into running these games. Starting out, I was completely by myself. I had a few friends that were interested in mega games, but only in a vague sort of way, and not enough that they wanted to commit to making something like this happen. As such, I wanted to start with something that I knew was doable, by just me. I decided to run Watch the Skies, buying a pack for it from the Mega Game Maker's website. And I looked into how difficult it would be to make this happen up here in Dundee. Uh, the first thing I did was I sort of did some rough maths, looking at the prices of renting a hall, costs of printing out all the game pieces, getting all the bits together, and then comparing that with ticket sale projections and sort of working out what would happen in a worst case scenario. Um, and I did discover that if nobody came, I would only be out about £200 which isn't a massive amount of money in the grand scale of things. I kept things sort of cheap with how I was going to do this. And I do think that it is important to be realistic when you try new things like this. And that's really what my first bit of advice is. Sort of really have a think about what you're trying to do and work out the price. Because I think you need to be comfortable to afford what would happen if nobody comes. 
Now the chances are people will come. But you never know, there could be a worldwide pandemic that closes everything for six months. So as a rule of thumb, I usually like to start by costing up any game I'm going to run, uh, seeing how much it would cost, and then look at make a list of the minimum number of viable players, so that if I do ever have to make the decision to pull the plug, I can do so. Uh, the first run of Watch the Skies in Dundee was a big success. Um, we totally sold out, probably because a lot of people hadn't attended any mega games, and so people had heard about it and were interested. Uh, we were able to fill the game, and we were able to fill the two optional countries, India and Brazil. Um, and we brought in a lot of new players, uh, and I still meet some of them in the mega game scene today, and it's in fact where I met Seamus. Uh, and my original Watch the Skies, it wasn't a terrible, I didn't really go too far from the, uh, the printed materials. So for the second game, uh, this was a little bit more ambitious. Uh, this was basically what I wanted to do, was sort of uh, capture that idea of legacy. Um, in particular, we see this now in a lot of game designs, such as the legacy genre, like Pandemic or Risk Legacy. Uh, we also see it in any video games by Bioware, with the uh, Dragon Age and Mass Effect sequels, building on this idea of picking up where you left off. I, I thought this might appeal to mega game players, so I set my second Watch the Skies as a sequel to the, uh, the first Watch the Skies, so the idea was the aliens had come back after what had happened in the original. It was a little bit more ambitious, but as I talk about later, um, I was still running a game that I knew at its core could work. Uh, the next game I ran was, in theory, the most risk-free and the easiest game I could have run. Uh, Jim was looking for places to host his Exterminator War, and I offered up Dundee because I knew obviously we had players that had attended the two games we'd run before this, and Jim was going to provide the entire game and all of the bits and pieces, and he was going to come up and help me run the game, and all I needed to do was the administration. So on paper, this was going to be a breeze. In reality, this turned out to be a total nightmare, but that was due to outside circumstances. Uh, the Beast from the East snowstorm uh, shut down all of Scotland the exact weekend we were trying to run the game. Uh, this kind of... It made it a lot more difficult to get the, the game going. Uh, whenever we did eventually reschedule, we clashed with another game, and this caused problems with player uh, casting and stuff. So a lot of lessons were learned in regards to organization uh, for that weekend. Uh, finally, and most recently, uh, I've ran the game Rebel Country. Uh, this is a fairly blatant not Star Wars that took place on a single planet called Alstara and was based around the idea of insurgency, specifically the Troubles in Northern Ireland, which is a topic I have a deep interest in. This was my first complete design, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about what I learned from this, and there was a, quite a few things I learned. During my development of Rebel Country, uh, Seamus invited me to get involved in starting True North, an initiative I backed enthusiastically for the very selfish reason that I wanted to play more games uh, rather than just constantly having to try, stressfully try and run a game uh, every year so that at least I'd have one mega game a year. So yeah, we'll talk about my advice on how to go about doing th this sort of thing solo. So I've taken my honestly not that much knowledge that I've gathered and I've distilled it down to what I think are three main points that I think applying to make, apply to running a mega game without a network. So the first one, don't reinvent the wheel. And this one is pretty basic. I don't recommend that anyone run a game that they designed as their first game if you're operating on your own. If you have a bunch of mega game experience or you're in an area where there are a lot of other mega game designers, that can help you out, then honestly, you could definitely run uh, a game that you've designed. But if you're in an area where you're the only person that really wants to do this sort of thing, or you're running the first game that the people in this area have seen, I wouldn't recommend trying to start from scratch. Start with something that's already there. Um, now, Becky mentioned exactly these two games, um, and for exactly the same two reason I have. Uh, Watch the Skies by Jim Wallman and Den of Wolves by John Meisen are both incredible games. Uh, they both are very easily accessible. Uh, they're purchasable on their, on their websites, and both are really well put together component packages. And I can't, recommend, I can't recommend them enough as just a great game right out of the box, both for the control to run it, and also for the players. Um, I think that it's important to emphasize, if you are going to go about starting running a mega game by yourself, that in your head you need to realize that it's not really about designing a game. Uh, making a game like this happen and getting... Uh, 40 to 50 people into a room to play it, it's more of an exercise in organization than it is to do with uh, the actual game design. Uh, organizing components, the venue, ticket sales, marketing, casting, will end up using far more of your time uh, than the actual design will. 
um, because you do just constantly have to deal with so many questions and communication. Now, perhaps you might not want to run Watch the Skies or Den of Wolves. Maybe you've seen or played both of those. Maybe the people you think are play- that you're looking as your audience will have played them both. I would still recommend that you purchase a game like this, a fully-fledged game. It might not necessarily be one of these. There are other games available. I think purchasing a game like this, or purchasing a game, gives you an idea of the scale of the number of components you need. It gives you an idea as to what sort of things you need to produce for your own game, and quite possibly will provide you with very usable mechanics that you can then put together with your own theme and setting. So, don't reinvent the wheel, don't work on, don't try and build new things which are unnecessary. So. So you want to innovate on your mega game. Now, if you're the type of person that wants to run a mega game, there is a pretty good chance that you've got some ideas that you think will improve the hobby or be a really great idea for a game. And I think they probably are really great ideas. In my humble opinion, however, the trick is that when you start out, you should probably just innovate on parts and leave the basis of the game intact. Now, these images are all from whenever I ran Watch the Skies 1 and 2. Uh, so Watch the Skies 1, I did the classic change. I changed the aliens. As I think everyone ends up doing this if you're running Watch the Skies, because if there's a chance other people will be aware of the sort of standard um, outcome of Watch the Skies, so you want to sort of change up on that. And because the aliens are so mysterious, it's not difficult to change them without sort of affecting the overall mechanics of the game. I ended up putting in two alien races. Uh, this was a little bit ambitious, and actually ended up sowing quite a lot of confusion, which was great for the players, but not so great for control, because the game actually isn't that well uh, designed for having two factions of aliens, and I didn't fully account for that. Um, So that's a sort of minor lesson in and of itself. In the second image, in the middle, uh, you can see basically an idea I had, which was to uh, start including more NPC factions, so basically having control-led entities that would sort of develop the game. This is particularly good because it doesn't involve changing the nature of the game for your players, um, but it can help change the narrative of the day. Now, specifically, the narrative of the My Watch This Guys 2 ended up having a um, basically ancient weapons of mass destruction buried inside pyramids that started to activate all over the Earth. And this had a great unifying effect of bringing the players and uh, from both the aliens and the human countries together to sort of uh, start dealing with a crisis. And because it's control-led, it's very easy. It's much easier to um, scale it uh, according to what the player's actions are, and also to ensure that its intensity hits just right. Um, if the players are making more than enough of a mess by themselves, it can be really good to have something that can just doesn't increase the intensity just now, or if things are going very quietly, maybe upping the intensity slightly. Uh, next are two are excerpts from two of the briefings I included with my Watch the Skies too. Uh, the base game of Watch the Skies divides players into, roughly, there's the alien teams and there's the national teams, which are the countries of the world. Um, but Watch the Skies 3 and 4, the two bigger ones run in London, uh, also included a lot of uh, extra nationals, uh, things like uh, religious groups, terrorist factions, and corporations. Uh, this was something I really enjoyed, and seeing as how Watch the Skies 1 had went so well, I decided to expand my Watch the Skies 2. So we had the same number of countries, but we also had three corporations, and an organization called the Long Watch. Uh, the Long Watch was definitely not XCOM that the players had established at the end of Watch the Skies 1. Um, so I made them a player playable group. They were a group of paramilitaries that basically went around the world begging the uh, countries to fund them. Uh, in the end, they shot the Secretary General of the UN uh, because they didn't agree with the amount of funding they had received and the amount of negotiation with aliens that was occurring. The corporations had a sort of different game, being extra national entities. They were sort of manipulating countries into making as much profits as they could. Uh, one of the countries tried to convince China to invade Norway. Um, who, China, awfully quick to agree to that, though, before we explained to them the consequences. Uh, and we also made one of the media teams a, um, a, a corporation, who ended up to be the most wealthy corporation in the game by the end because people were willing to pay a lot for PR and they bought uh, a moon base uh, in the final turn of the game. So the key thing about all of these changes is although they radically changed the structure and nature of the day, they didn't actually alter what the players were doing on a minute-to-minute basis. Um, What they were doing and how they were interacting was still there. The strong engine of the game was underneath, which is what I was relying on, so I could add as many bells and whistles as I wanted. I would recommend that if you are looking to uh, innovate on a game, I would start by making changes to a game that already exists. 
And I think as well as that, um, any sort of innovation should probably be tested out on something that you already know works. If you're thinking about adding digital app support to a game, maybe trial it with a game that already works quite well and see if the digital side of it is improving the game or if it's making things worse. I think that's the only way we can really know if these innovations are good for the for the community. And then finally, uh, keep it simple, stupid. This is a bit of advice that I think may seem obvious to any mega game veterans, uh, but I suspect that almost every mega game designer has fallen victim to this at some point. Uh, so what's happening in all of these pictures? Well, you're all muted, so I'll just answer myself. Uh, and that's Mega Games' greatest gameplay, talking. Uh, the game, for all Mega Games, is actually in the communication between the players. The imperfect knowledge making its way around the room is the most important aspect of Mega Games. The mechanics and rule interactions are the window dressing to the communication, not the other way around. Everything you do when organizing a game should be about promoting a situation where people walk around and talk to each other. If you've been playing close attention, you will notice that I haven't spent much time talking about the wonderful ideas I had with Rebel Country, because fundamentally I believe I forgot this rule. The game I made was too complicated on a rules level, which ultimately made it unbalanced when it was played within a room of 50 players. So now we're going to go on to a little segment I like to call Lessons from Alstara. So, I've included some results from my online feedback. I also had paper feedback, which confirmed the trends we see here. So four players, if you look on the right-hand side there, out of 14, having a pretty bad time by the end of the day, um, is, is not great. I think it's quite significant, um, especially when most of the people that are filling in this feedback are probably friends of mine or friendly with me. So I do think that the, the, the feedback trends quite high as a result of the fact that people know me personally. And as well as that, the Rebels actually had a great day at Rebel Country. It was the Imperials that had a much rougher day. Um, so I did look into the game and I went through the sort of the feedback with a fine tooth comb and yeah you couldn't say that the game was overall a disaster certainly half of the players did have a great time and I think that this was due to the fact that I did make the I made very complicated movement and support rules for the Imperials which turned the Imperial game into kind of a logistical nightmare which can be a really fun gaming experience, don't get me wrong. I, I really like Milsim games. But there wasn't enough to hold the Rebels back to accommodate the inefficiency the Imperials ended up having. Another valuable Rebel Country lesson I learned was that you can't design player behaviors. I technically knew this, but the mistake I made was that I had a lot of the game hinge on the Imperial Governor, who on the day went full rogue, which is fine. It's a great, nar great narrative happening right there, a uh, sort of emergent gameplay. The problem was that as a designer, I had placed far too much importance on that role. So when he went, a number of players were suddenly sort of locked out of having fun. Um, so that was a, a mistake in the design. I attempted to make a lot some of the Imperial gameplay a board gamey puzzle. Um, and that again feeds into my keep it simple, stupid advice. Those players were busy playing a board game that wasn't as engaging as playing a mega game. Um, and they were missing out on that good mega game gameplay talking. And finally, I'd say probably one of the biggest mistakes I made was not including a forum of communication for the Rebels and the Imperials to communicate. I should have included some sort of still-functioning Senate body where both sides could meet and compete in a more overtly political arena. Uh, I realized this after the fact, um, in particular as well, with sort of more Star Wars knowledge as I learned um, that I just picked the wrong era, I should have picked pre A New Hope, um, or just not set it in Star Wars. Both of those would have been better decisions than what I ended up doing. Uh, so in short, simple mechanics are good mechanics, and always make sure that your rules have recourse for a control to resolve situations not covered in the rules. So yeah, conclusions. Uh, I understand that I might sound like maybe this is not worth attempting to do, maybe this is uh, maybe a little bit too rough, maybe it's not for you, but I can't emphasize enough how rewarding running your own games can be. And don't fear, there is lots of support available. I put some logos up on this slide to sort of give you some ideas, um, such as uh, tools that really help make these games work. Uh, Google Drive uh, makes online collaboration incredibly easy. Uh, it's completely free, and it's so easy to share and work with people, even if you're separated by distance. Uh, PayPal is fantastic for just ensuring customer um, 
a customer trust. Uh, when people know that they're paying you by PayPal, they know that that is a backed up thing that they can get paid back on, if, and they know that they're not going to be scammed. And Eventbrite has been useful for just creating a sort of flashy front end uh, that means whenever you do tickets, it looks like a, a professionally run event. And you can set up all of this, and I had this all set up from my first mega game. So even without the support of anyone else, I was able to set all this up by myself. But much more importantly, I cannot emphasize enough how great the community mega games have built up. There are literally people lining up to help each other all over the internet. This crisis has been fantastic at showing that. Uh, Becky talked about this a little bit, but yeah, in the short period of lockdown, uh, I've seen at least five or six different quarantine games that have been started digitally, built from scratch, and willingly tested and controlled by volunteers to make it happen. Over what has been a very short six to ten week period, I've included the logos of some of the local networks that I've interacted with, all of which are run by fantastically friendly and welcoming people. And there's someone in all of these groups who will happily step up to answer any questions a burgeoning designer may have. In most of those groups, it will probably be Jerry. The knowledge base is out there to make your mega game dreams happen. So thanks for listening to my slightly rambling, hopefully slightly useful, TED Talk on mega games. I'm now happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you very much, Kieran. Um, if everyone wants to start putting their questions into the chat, we can get the ball rolling for that. And uh, can we get some claps in the in the general as well? Okie dokie. So, Rose, um, how long did? Oh, I just ended my screen. I'm still here. Sorry, it made me panic. I thought we were having technical. No, no. Um, how long did it take you to find and arrange the venue for your first mega game? Uh, so I'm very lucky. Uh, we have a really great venue in Dundee. Um, I only uh, visited it about three or four venues. Um, in Dundee, there isn't that many venues in general, to be honest. Um, but the venue I ended up using was one that I'd already was familiar with as a result of uh, doing sports. So in reality, I had a venue pretty early on. Um, so I'm afraid it didn't really take me that long. <laughs> um, and they were they were very happy to sort of negotiate on price. Magic. Um, one from Kenny. Uh, when working on a new or tweaked version of a game, what are some of the ways you have used to test the mechanics, functionality ahead of the big day? Yeah, so obviously it's very difficult to test uh, the scale of a mega game. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Uh, the easiest way I find is to get maybe five or six people into a room and each one of them to act as part of a uh, act as the entire mind of a single faction and basically run through the mechanics. Um, when doing that, I do still think it can be difficult to sort of predict, um, which is why I sort of emphasized a lot about basically using mechanics that you already know it works and making your mechanics as simple as possible. Um, so yeah, basically small testing breakouts is, is the main method that I've used. Marvellous. Will the summary of the presentation be available, is Nick's asking. Yeah, I can easily put my presentation up. Obviously, the presentation is mostly pictures, but I've got all my notes written down, so I'll happily provide those as well. Um, I'll get those somewhere up uh, for the... Uh, uh, somewhere on the True North, probably on this Discord. I think we'll be able to put that somewhere and yeah. maybe pin it into the general symposium. And also, I mean, I guess the recording is going to be available. I think Seamus has mentioned that. Yes, I believe uh, Becky's actually recording the whole mm -hmm. um, event today, so people will be able to watch back. Um, so we've got another question from Ed. A second request for the summary. Of, oh, okay. Yeah, that's kind of related that's just, to the yeah. uh, presentation one. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll happily provide that. Cool. Um. Stone, paper, scissors. What is your next game going to be about? Uh, this is interesting because I had a game planned that would be roughly at the end of next month if uh, lockdown hadn't occurred. It was going to be basically very office space. Um, but when I started writing it, it was like uh, December, no, November last year. And it was going to be very much about sort of like evolving political situation around the UK and Brexit and sort of a satirical look at that sort of thing. Um, 
And then this year has just been such a roller coaster that that game is just outdated. There's just there's no, no way it could work now. So I honestly don't know what my next game will be. Um, I have some ideas and things that I'd like to try. Um, I mean, maybe. <laughs> 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 Maybe Rebel Country too, but I think that that game just needs to be rebuilt rather than. I don't know if a sequel is a good idea. <laughs> okay, Magic. We'll take another couple questions. If anybody else has anything they'd like to say, and then we'll go for her break. Got a couple people typing, so. Okie dokie. If you had to promote mega games in a region where they hadn't happened at all before, um, would you do it similarly to how you promoted mega games in Dundee, or would you change your approach? Uh, that's a good game. Uh, good question, Ed. Um, I think that if you're looking to promote mega games in an area, particularly in person mega games, um, I think you need to really be involved in that area. I don't know how you could possibly uh, promote games remotely, if you know what I mean. Um, so in Dundee, I was big, uh, particularly when I was running Watch the Skies 1 and 2, I was big in running uh, weekly role-playing games uh, in our local pub, uh, as well as connections with our local uh, friendly local game store and a board gaming club that was happening in Waterstones. So at the time, I was meeting an awful lot of the people that were already playing traditional sort of analog games. So I knew a lot of the people that were interested. And I do think that that is part of what sort of helps organically grow it. But saying that, I was lucky enough that lots of people did end up coming from other places so the um yeah the uh, i think that basically i think that facebook is an okay method um which is mostly what i've done most of my marketing on i do think that there's probably a challenge coming up now as more and more people move away from facebook trying to find an equally good online method to sort of share information and contact people um it's not one that i have actually solved yet though so i because uh, yeah i didn't I've cancelled the game I was running this year, so. <laughs> Magic. Uh, I, and again, how do you find new players? I think you've kind of... Yeah, it's basically um, yeah. mostly marketing and then also just, I think you have to sort of find roots in through other people's interests. Um, thank you, Matty. And one last question from Becky Becky. Um, are there certain genres that you think work better for new communities both watch the skies and den of wolves are sci-fi do you think that this genre is better for new mega game groups are there any other genres that you would think would work really well uh, i actually i actually think that uh, genre i think any genre could work um i was super psyched when i saw tropi uh, last year and I mean, my game this year was going to just be based on sort of like working in an office, but a slightly satirical one. Um, I do think that sci-fi is an easy draw for the particularly uh, the expected board games community. Um, I think that people already like a lot of uh, board gamers in particular, like things like Warhammer and you've also got like the Star Wars sort of um, tabletop games. Um, I think that's what makes sci-fi such a strong in. But I think equally sort of like the real world genre can attract a lot of people. Um, I do know that a number of the people that attended Watch the Skies 2 were attending it from Glasgow because there was a group of people out there that were really interested in the real world politics side of things. Um, they were sort of only vaguely interested in the aliens part of it. They really just wanted to pretend to be countries and talk about sort of like trade relations and stuff. And a couple of them mentioned that the aliens were just a little over the top for, in their minds. Um, so I do think that any genre could work. Um, but I think if you're starting a community from scratch, I think it's better to start with something that will definitely work. Um, but I don't think the designers should feel that they should limit themselves in, in genre. I think that uh, growing new genres is definitely the way to go, um, especially with uh, your definition of the third generations of designers. I think that's uh, a, a real positive motion. Fantastic. Okay. Okay.